It is an August different from any other in UNC Charlotte's history. We return to campus with the optimism that accompanies the start of a new semester, and for many of us, painful memories of last spring. For Niner Nation, in the days following the April 30th tragedy, we found strength in listening to one another. We continue to do that today. With me in studio is John Bogdan, Associate Vice Chancellor for Safety and Security. Also with us is Sarah Smyer, a Lieutenant with UNC Charlotte Police and Public Safety. And with us as well is Larry Gordine, Director of Student Assistance and Support Services. Our conversation will be guided by questions you submitted online and our sincere thanks to all of you who shared your thoughts. Your contributions will help shape not only our conversation today, but also the university's approach in the coming year. Let's begin by establishing some context about where we are now. John, what has the university done since April 30th to make sure that the university is secure and what can we expect over the coming year? Uh, thanks, Will. Uh, we, we've done a host of uh, different things to, uh, to improve or enhance security at this point. Um, some of the more significant ones are we, we've completed a very uh, deliberate uh, internal review uh, looking at our response recovery and, uh, and uh, uh, the actions taken uh, the, the day, or excuse me, the training for the actions taken the day of. Um, we have uh, uh, secured a contract with National Police Foundation partnering with the International Association for Campus Law Enforcement um, to conduct a, a, a third party external review. They've assembled a team of subject matter experts that will come in and, and give us a very thorough review of, of uh, all actions taken uh, until then. Uh, we've hired two uh, additional uh, rangers for improving uh, uh, security on the, at the light rail. Um, we've trained eight additional ALICE instructors, uh, bringing our total to 13 and allowing us to, to uh, effectively pair ALICE instructors with uh, each college for, for better availability and, and capability of, of the training. Um, and, and then coming up in the, in the future, uh, we have, we've scheduled a total, I think at this point, of eight uh, in community enhanced uh, uh, ALICE training, uh, large group trainings for uh, uh, active assailant training available to students, faculty, and staff um, uh, to better prepare people for uh, uh, any, any sort of emergency situations in the future. Um, we have, uh, uh, we will have a, a significantly increased police presence uh, focused around community-oriented policing uh, as the semester begins. Things like uh, additional uh, bicycle patrols, uh, additional dismounted or walking patrols, a, as well as partner patrols with our with our local agencies to incorporate them in in the the safety as well as their familiarity with our with our student population. Um, uh, lastly, we've implemented uh, uh, increased security standards for large venue events such as like football games and commencement. Uh, you'll see metal detectors and more restrictive bag policies. Um, and uh, increased police presence for, for all uh, things of, of that nature. Now we'll get into ALICE training a bit more uh, later in the show, but for those who aren't familiar with it, what does that entail? Um, so uh, ALICE is an acronym that stands for uh, Alert, Lockdown, Inform, Counter, and Evacuate. Uh, and it, it uses the basic run, hide, fight model to teach uh, techniques uh, to for being prepared to respond to an active assailant as well as things to do to secure yourself and or uh, uh, counter if if the uh, situation presents itself. Larry, I want to bring you in uh, to discuss what mental health services and other resources are available for students as they transition back onto campus. We know that when students return we're expecting them to have lots of questions uh, about how they're going to be, if they're going to walk by Kennedy, uh, Kennedy Building, but some of the resources that we have specifically to mental health is we have our Center for Counseling and Psychological Services. It's a great resource that um, students can go if they're needing um, trouble, whether academics or just trying to explain how they, they feel. Students can utilize those resources on an emergency basis if they feel like they need to meet with someone that day they can go in and speak to the counselor that's there uh, on an emergency basis. Or if they want to schedule out a meeting, um, they can call the counseling center um, at 8 a.m. to try to set up an appointment. And so the staff in the counseling center are there available to meet with our students and prepared as students come back 
to address some of the mental um, distresses or in crisis that they may have. Other support resources that they have on campus uh, would be the Office of Student Assistance and Support Services. When you're having a psychological uh, distress and you have other personal issues that are impacting our, our students, um, their academics may suffer due to that. Um, and we're like at to the overall holistic health and wellness of the student. And so staff in the Office of Student Assistance and Support Services can meet with students on a walk-in basis or a scheduled basis to kind of talk about what are their needs. And that staff will assess their needs from an academic standpoint but also personally. And so a lot of times when we're meeting with students and we start to peel back the layers of the issues that they are experienced, we can kind of pinpoint whether it's a financial need or having a physical or psychological distress. And our job is to come up with an individualized care plan for those students and then help facilitate connection to the different types of resources on campus. Again, whether it's the counseling center or the student health center, the disabilities office, or reaching out to faculty on a student's behalf to let them know that the students have met with a staff member and they're having some issues we are encouraging you or act for your lenience to um, support that student from an academic standpoint. So we're trying to look at it from a holistic standpoint, um, not just from a physical or psychological standpoint as well in terms of success of our students here at the university. What about faculty and staff who may be looking for a similar type of resource? Okay. So there's two uh, particular programs that is designed specifically to look at for faculty and staff to return. And one of those programs um, it's called the Community Active Assailant Response Training. And so that program is designed specifically not just for faculty but students as well and what you can in encounter or how are you going to respond in a crisis situation. Um, what kind of tips and strategies will be available and so they are scheduled to have about five different programs uh, trainings throughout this semester that we certainly encourage both faculty and staff um, to look at and sign up for. The other program um, that are designed for faculty and staff is the return to campus tips on how to support our students. And so oftentimes we will get calls from faculty members regarding a myriad of different issues, but specifically how to help facilitate the conversation uh, regarding the events um, of April the 30th. Um, what ways can you look at um, identifying students who are in um, psychological distress or, or in crisis and then get them connected to resources. John, some of the most common questions we received earlier this week were centered around securing the campus itself. Now as far as the land on which the university sits, we hear the term open campus quite a bit. Could you explain what that means and the university's position on people who aren't affiliated with UNC Charlotte coming to campus. Certainly. Um, so uh, uh, UNC Charlotte is a public uh, university, public institution, and as such is, is fully available to and accessible to the, the community around us. Uh, and we, and you know, in a spirit of an, an open and, and a welcoming environment, we, we want to make sure that the, the community understands that and that they, you know, that they have this uh, a great university available to them. Sarah, with that in mind, what does police and public safety do as far as identifying suspicious individuals, people who shouldn't be here, and removing them if necessary? Sure, Wills. So as John mentioned, we are a public institution. It is open to the public, and we do see a lot of traffic through the community that may not necessarily be affiliated with the campus. Police and public safety takes all calls for service seriously, and we do respond to all calls for service where someone may identify suspicious activity. Our main goal in establishing a response for that suspicious activity is identifying the subjects and then identifying if the activity that is reported to be suspicious actually rises to the level of being a law or a policy violation. And if we interact with individuals that are not affiliated on campus that are found to be in violation of a law or policy, they are asked to leave the campus. Sometimes, depending on the violation, it can be corrected on scene if it's a minor violation and, and turned into an educational moment. And if it's one of the major violations, they will be trespassed from campus. Larry, looking at our own population, what can students, faculty, and staff, what are some signs they could look for that, that a peer or a classmate might be struggling and need some help? And then uh, what can they do as far as getting that person some resources? Yeah. I would say some of the signs would be first identify that um, your students 
uh, your peers um, are in distress. Some of those signs could be um, absentee from class, um, diminished academic work, um, disheveled in their, their appearance, or even written expressions in, 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 in assignments um, that they're having. And so ways that faculty um, can support students um, and then students can support their peers, it's just one, being aware that there is an issue and then knowing what to do and where to go um, to get the help that they need. And so they can um, encourage students to visit the counseling center, visit the Office of Student Assistance Support Services, or if they want to refer a student, they can go to incidentreport.uncc.edu to report a current concern for a student. And then someone in the Office of Student Assistance Support Services will reach out to that student to request a meeting to kind of talk about um, the issues and, and concerns that they may have as it relates to their academics, but their overall health and well-being. Sarah, with the increased police presence that John mentioned coming to campus, what is police and public safety doing to make sure that the interactions between police and the campus community continue to be uh, positive? So the goal of the increased presence on campus during the first couple of weeks of school is a community-oriented approach. Our goal is to educate and interact with students, be available to answer questions related to where buildings may be, and also about programs and things that are available on campus for students revolving around safety. It also allows us to partner with our neighboring agencies so that our neighbor agencies are both familiar with our campus as well as with our student population because we do enjoy mutual aid agreements that allow both agencies to work well together. So that is one of our goals during that first couple of weeks. I think it's important to note that our agency is a very diverse agency that is reflective of our university population. We have an over 40% diverse department and our goal is to integrate those officers in with the community and that's why we want to make sure everybody is out and about those first couple of weeks of school. John, another common question uh, we saw this week was related to securing buildings and particularly classrooms that may not currently have a lock or whose doors may open outwards. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what the university is doing to address that and some of the resources that will be available uh, for students, faculty, and staff over the coming year? Certainly. So uh, to clarify, as far as buildings go, we have the, the lockdown system that allows us to secure with the push of a button at the dispatch all the outer doors on, on every building on campus, uh, which we used on, on April 30th and, and it worked very well. Um, we, the, uh, uh, the locking of internal doors, some doors are uh, either swing out, maybe they're not equipped with, with, with a lock, uh, and that's one of the, the uh, reasons we really push uh, folks to attend the, the ALICE training. Because um, one of the things that, that you can learn in ALICE training is techniques for securing a door that doesn't have a lock or isn't equipped with one, you don't have the key for it, etc. Uh, the simplest one of which is a simple wedge, a door wedge. You can purchase one, they make a specific one uh, that you know, they make available that you can wedge under the door to block it. Um, you can use your, your belt, take your belt off and attach it around the, the control arm for an outswing door to try and uh, you know, limit that from opening. Uh, uh, having a simple thing like a cargo strap in your bag that you can wrap around door handles or hook in the door and attach to something else helps secure it. So there's a, there's a, a host of different techniques and things like that you can learn through the ALICE training that, that you know, help prepare you in any environment, not just here on campus, but anywhere you might find yourself that you might have to respond and, and need to secure yourself. Um, and then additionally, uh, the Department of Safety and Security is assessing the feasibility of installing locks or locking type devices on all the interior doors on campus. Uh, and we'll, uh, you know, in the future come out with, with the ideas for whether or not that can be done, costs associated, uh, et cetera. And Police and Public Safety is available for consultations on individual classrooms should a faculty member or student have a question about that. Absolutely. Yeah, if you, you contact us, we'll be glad to come out. Uh, you know, look at your specific, do a walk through your, your, your classroom with you and talk about ways you might think about uh, securing it if need to be. Larry, while this work is ongoing on the safety side of things, what uh, is your office doing to make students, faculty, and staff feel comfortable and connected as they return to campus? We're certainly trying to create a culture um, of care here at the university, and so staff are open to meeting with faculty 
who would like to have individual meetings to talk about ways to continue to support those students from an academic standpoint. And so we want everyone, uh, the mantra is to see something, say something. And so in order to create a culture of care, I know we're kind of all in this together. And the more that we can show support to everyone on campus community, and again, identifying some of those signs that students are in distress or faculty members, is kind of the first step in getting the support. Um, that faculty, staff, and students need um, to create a, a culture of care and safety here at the university. Sarah, I want to walk through a few additional questions on safety and security with you. How does the university, university law enforcement, how do they handle crime that's near but not on campus? Um, and, and what is done, what sort of uh, crime actually makes its way from areas external to campus onto campus? So that's an excellent question, Wills. We have a mutual aid agreement with the Charlotte Mer Mecklenburg Police Department that allows us to patrol and assist CMPD just off campus and in the areas surrounding. And what that means is when Charlotte Mecklenburg Police respond to a call for service near campus, they usually notify us of that crime if it is a crime that could spill over onto campus. We have radio interoperability and we oftentimes will respond out to assist them and if something comes onto campus they come on campus and assist us with that as well. We don't see a lot of spillover. We do have an occasional spillover but generally when something happens off campus uh, we're able to get it contained before it spreads onto the campus area. We've talked a little bit about security related to light rail and some have expressed concern about um, individuals from outside the university using light rail to come to campus and uh, potentially uh, cause issues. What security measures has the university put in place uh, to, to allow light rail to be a safe and secure method of transportation for our community? So in addition to the cameras that are already placed throughout campus, additional cameras have been placed on the light rail platform area so we can monitor that through the video footage. And we also have rangers and officers that are stationed at the light rail platform as well as blue light phones that are nearby, but we monitor that area heavily and make sure that we have a presence there. For students uh, moving around campus who want to feel uh, extra secure or maybe uh, have a night class and, and need to return to their dorm uh, or to their apartment at night, what, what sort of resources are available in that case? The first thing that I always recommend to all students, faculty, and staff is to download the LiveSafe app. This is an app that is free of charge to all students, faculty, and staff, and it allows you to use the safety walk feature, which would let somebody track you when you walk. So you could allow one of your friends to see where you are to make sure you're getting from point A to point B safely. It also enables you the ability with one push of a button to dial police and public safety or send police and public safety a text message. In addition to the Live Safe app, I always recommend that folks walk in groups. Do not walk alone at night. Even if you feel safe and secure, it's always better to walk in a group. We have the on-campus bus routes that have bus stops pretty regularly throughout campus. There's also an app associated with that so you can schedule your bus time and see where the bus routes are so you can stay in the building and then leave and go to the bus stop when you know your bus is nearby. And as a last resort, if you ever feel unsafe, you can always call police and public safety and when an officer is available, we will come out and meet with you and make sure that you get to your destination safely. There were some questions about uh, people who are moving from campus to an off-campus location, such as uh, the apartments just outside of our footprint. What, what's available for those sorts of students? I would say also the LiveSafe app, because no matter where you are, that LiveSafe app has the functionality as a normal app would. It's not just exclusive to campus, so you could still utilize it to allow somebody to see where you're walking. I would still say walk with a friend. Some of our bus services go a little bit off of campus. Some of the off-campus housing also has bus services available. Our safety escorts do not extend off campus, generally, except, except in an extenuating circumstances. So I would recommend following kind of those same, those same um, safety principles no matter where you are. John, we heard uh, a great deal of questions on both sides of this issue, but people were asking questions about guns on campus. Can you tell us what that policy is and where it comes from? Certainly. So uh, North Carolina state law prohibits the carry of firearms on any educational property except for law enforcement. Uh, and we really don't, you know, have any latitude uh, uh, to uh, 
with regard to the law. We enforce the law and we leave the uh, uh, lawmaking up to legislatures. Uh, but we do have, uh, you know, latitude to provide training, things like the Alice we talked about, the Live Safe app that uh, Sarah was talking about, that, that you know, work to keep the entire uh, uh, campus that much uh, more prepared and safe. And policy issues like that will, I'm sure, continue to be debated across the state and the country. I want to bring us a little closer to home with you, Larry, for the final word. You've expressed in the past a, a deep love for the college experience, for campus life. What can the UNC Charlotte community do uh, to connect back with that such singular experience that is uh, life on a university campus in a healthy way? I think conversations are always important. And for those conversations to take place, you know, both students, faculty, and staff have to feel comfortable. And being comfortable after knowing what resources are, are available out there to them. And so some of the trainings that we, uh, the university is proposing, um, it says the community active assailant um, response training, and then returning to campus, um, how to support our students is the beginning of that conversation in terms of feeling comfortable. And, and, and talking about ways that we can also participate um, and, and safety overall here um, at the university. It's a great time. Um, students are in that age where they're learning, and growing, and, and, and developing. And so the more tools and skills that we can um, teach students um, and how to look out for their friends or even recognizing their own signs and symptoms that they may be struggling. And it's okay to reach out for help and faculty and staff um, also in identifying those, those signs and, and, and knowing what resources available, I think is crucial in terms of our overall safety here at the university. And so we're excited about the fall and we're hoping to have uh, a lot of participation in these trainings. Um, I said, you know, see something, say something, is kind of that mantra and how we're going about to build a culture of care at the university. With that, thank you all for joining us and thank you all for watching. For John Bogdan, Sarah Smyer, and Larry Gordine, I'm Will City, and we are all Niners.